Hi, Joyce. Hi, Doug. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good, thanks. Is I Bill here? Talking. I haven't seen him. Who? Bill? Oh, he he, he he's in Bozeman, Montana right now. Um, he's participating with the Rocky Mountain Plein Air Painters Group and painting up there for a week. And he'll return to Jackson, I don't know, Saturday, Sunday, something like that. Cool. Yeah. How many people do you have today? I don't know. Uh, no. Somewhere around 10, probably. Good. Okay. I was just looking over this uh, stuff you sent us. And, um, you know, I taught CCD for a lot of years, and we, we memorized the definition of a sacrament our whole life and passed it on to these kids. And I see that they've updated the words a little bit. <laughs> it's now called an efficacious sign instead of an outward sign. <laughs> well, the, the um, yeah. And, and they say, by which divine life is dispensed to us. We used to say, to give grace. <laughs> I guess maybe I had the first grade definition. I think. Uh, my the, the definition that I use when I'm explaining it to adults. Um, I, I use two different definitions. One I use really simple because I, I use a small s sacrament as an encounter with God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, so for me, when I get up in the morning and look out at the mountains, it's a sacramental moment. <laughs> it uh, is although, yeah. <laughs> although right now we can't see the mountains. It's so smoky. Where are the fires? Oregon, Northern California, Nevada, Arizona, yeah. Colorado. Same problem we've had for the last two years. We, yeah. we have no fires right here, thank God, knock on wood. Yeah. Uh, but the fires far away make it so hazy we can't see. Yeah, that's yeah. what Bill was saying, that he, he couldn't see the mountains. And I saw a satellite image, um, I think yesterday. It's, <laughs> there's no smoke in Oregon or Washington or the California. The smoke goes from east of there all the way down to Mexico. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Um, my granddaughter sent me a picture yesterday from Colorado, and it's just terrible there, too. Yeah. Yep. I live in Colorado, and I can't see the mountains for like oh, two weeks. It's horrible. And yeah. it smells, and ugh. And then last year, it was even worse because we had fires. Uh, it was. I'm sick of smoke, and I don't know when it's gonna get better. Uh, you guys, Jennifer uh, is a new addition to our little group. She came to Mass two weeks ago, heard the announcement, and said, "Can can I join you? I, I don't live here." I said, "Sure." This is because of the way we do it. Uh, yeah, um, this is awesome. Very few of us are sitting in Jackson right now, Jennifer. It's uh, <laughs> Doug, is it? <laughs> well, Pat and Jody and uh, well, it says Tom, but but Shelly are in uh, are here too. Marsha, who you see in the middle there, is in Ohio. Uh, Joyce is in Michigan. That's so cool. <laughs> um, I think uh, Julie Stainer is going to join us as well from California. We'll see. Yep. Pat, this is the first uh, session you're joining us with. The, so, several of other members of this group have done three, four, five of these uh, programs in the, in the last year or so. Glad you're with us. Thank you. Today's session is... Uh, the video is fairly long. It's a little over 35 minutes. So we, we typically 
uh, have a, a hard stop time of, of 11 o'clock mountain. So we go for one hour, uh, but I'm gonna wait today for a couple of minutes to start um, to, uh, in, in case people are a little bit late. Uh, uh, did any of you have a problem logging on with Zoom? Nope. No. no. And I'm not Zoom. I'm not a Zoom person, so I did good. I practiced with my husband a, a couple days ago, and I made it. Perfect. Perfect. So, Shelly, Tom's not joining us today. Nope, you just Here. muted. There you go. Okay. He he's in a meeting, and if he can get out, he'll show up. He told me okay. to go represent him. <laughs> <laughs> so he actually so for, he's in a uh, meeting over there. Over there. <laughs> so for the people that are that are new, well, that's you, Jennifer and Pat. <laughs> Pat, I see you muted yourself. What, um, as we're going, I don't care if you're uh, muted or unmuted, unless there's other noise or voices or people talking in the background, then I'd appreciate it if you mute, uh, but just be ready to unmute if you wanna talk. Uh, I probably will not unmute at all, uh, unless some noise starts here. Um, but once the video starts, uh, I'll, uh, what, what I'll do is about 30 seconds in, I'm, I'm used to stopping the video about 30 seconds in and asking you all, can you hear and see it just fine? Because uh, every once in a while we have a little, we have a little glitch, but I've done well over a hundred Zooms now. Um, so I think I have it down. I do have 10 o'clock. We got uh, seven of us on right now. Um, let me look here. Now we got 12 people that are signed up to be on this session. We'll see, we'll see if they join. We'll wait one more minute. Sunday and uh, told him how excited I was about this class. And I said, you know, on what that first page, I saw uh, Samuel Aquila's name on there. And I said, well, did you do this yet? And he said, no, I think in a year or two, we're going to. And I'm like, well, I'm doing it now. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, and one thing that I said in the email, and I'll say to all of you again, is if you have any friends or uh, anybody that you start talking about this and I say, wow, I'd like to, uh, uh, I, I'd like to do this too. Uh, tell them to contact me, to email me. We're recording this session. I don't know if you can see up in the uh, upper part of the thing. It says we're recording it. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I should tell you that anyway, so that if people join next week, we can send them this one so that they can review it. And if any of you have to miss one of them, I always send it out about two or three days later. I send it, you know, and if you want to watch the video again um, uh, or listen to our discussion. Okay, I got two minutes after, so I think we're going to begin. And uh, I'm going to begin with the, the prayer that's on um, page 10 of the, of the handout that I sent you. And I'll just pray the prayer. And try to let these, these words and images just sink into your heart. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Divine Savior, we come to your sacred table to nourish ourselves, not with bread, but with yourself, true bread of eternal life. Help us daily to make a good and perfect meal of this divine food. Let us be continually refreshed by the perfume of your kindness and goodness. May the Holy Spirit fill us with his love. Meanwhile, let us prepare a place for this holy food by emptying our hearts. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So uh, before we start, I don't know if any of you had a chance to read over that handout that was the introduction or this handout uh, for session one, but 
any questions, comments, anything about, or anything that's going on, you know, in the world or your lives right now that you want to say something about before we start the video? So there is another handout besides this one. Uh, which was that say? The, I that have the, presence, the mystery of the Eucharist. Okay, I don't have such one. I'll go back and print that after class, Doug. Thank you. Okay, so we so there's one, uh, Joyce. Um, I didn't copy the cover page just to save save okay. place for me. There's I sent you two handouts. Okay, I just got uh, one. All right. Yeah, one that says introduction, and one that says I think session one or something like that. So the introduction. Yep, that's session one, right there, the Pat's holding up. Okay, um, I'll go print so that later. Session one is the one that we'll focus on. The introduction one I, um, is just for your background. It's, it's, we're not gonna talk about it unless you want to. Uh, I didn't even print it off for myself. I read it over uh, about a week ago. Uh, it's, it's stuff that you all probably know already, mm -hmm. um, but it's a good reminder. And I'll tell you today's session, um, when I think back on of it, on it, I, I think f for for somebody who already has a, a deep understanding and a, and a, and a deep um, acceptance of the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist, this is going to be. I, I'm not sure you'll learn anything new. You might learn some some cool little events and some anecdotes, but I don't think um, I don't think you're going to learn any huge big things. Uh, Maybe you will, I don't know. But I have to tell you that this, this video today is beautiful. It's, um, it's visually beautiful and the music is beautiful and even the voices are beautiful. And it's not just Tim Gray talking. Um, it's him talking part of the time, uh, but it's a bunch of other folks as well. So uh, I, I really liked this one. Um, it just made me feel good. Um, somebody else, said they watched it and it brought tears to their eyes. So I hope you'll enjoy it. And it's now five after, I don't see anybody else on. If anybody else joins, I'll click them in, uh, but let's get started. Or for, uh, actually I should ask one more time, any other comments or questions about stuff you, uh, you had before this? Okay. Let's begin. Why does it keep? of December 4th. Okay, can everybody see in here okay? Yep, mine disappeared, but I'm back. Okay, good. <laughs> Away we go. 1912, with an account of a fire, a church, and a remarkable rescue. At 6.06 a.m., a fire broke out in the basement library, the regular meeting room of the Knights of Columbus Smoking Club. Of St. Philip Neri Roman Catholic Church in the Bronx, New York. Passerby, seeing the flames, raised the alarm by ringing the meal bell of the adjoining clerical refectory. Minutes later, a crowd of neighborhood gawkers gathered on the street below as the New York Fire Department assembled on Grand Boulevard, in the concourse opposite to East 202nd Street. Deputy Fire Chief Barrett mobilized his crew in the rear of the building, and they began the work of containing the now raging inferno. At 8.21 a.m., Chief Barrett instructed his men that due to the fire being fully involved and fully developed, no one was allowed to enter the church. The likelihood of surviving inside St. Philip Neri Church was now approaching zero. Thanks be to God. No one was inside. Suddenly, two priests were seen rushing from the adjoining rectory. 
These men were Father Daniel Berg and Father Joseph Congedo. Struggling through the sea of first responders, the men charged into their beloved chapel, disappearing into the smoky interior of the ill-fated facade. No one expected them to return. Miraculously, moments later, the two priests emerged, Father Burke bearing an object wrapped in a handkerchief, and Father Congedo at his side with lit candle in hand. What was it that these two men risked their lives to save? What was this thing? Bread. Please tell me this wasn't just about bread. to a burning building to rescue the Eucharist while everyone else is running out. I mean, it's crazy, right? But maybe not. Maybe it's the most sane thing they could have done. Third century Roman Empire. Tarsicius, a 12-year-old boy, living during the time of the Roman persecutions. Tarsicius was sent out with the Eucharist to give to Christians condemned to death. Along the way, he was stopped by a group of boys. They discovered he was Christian and became anxious to see what he was holding. Tarsicius refused. The gang became enraged, beating him so he would give up his holy mysteries. He never did. He was beaten to death. 1581, England. During the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, it was considered an act of treason to say the mass. To make matters worse, it was Doug, did the sound stop? I don't have sound. I don't have sound. I don't have sound. 1900s. There we do. China. In the Chinese country, is it okay now? Yeah. Yeah. Says destroying a small Catholic church. The priest was arrested, the tabernacle stolen, and the sacred hosts were strewn across the floor. A small girl, whom no one noticed in the back of the church, witnessed the desecration and saw where these 32 sacred hosts had landed. For each of the next 32 nights. She snuck past the guards back into the church, prayed in front of the Eucharist, and consumed them one by one. On the last night, after the girl had received the final Eucharist, she accidentally woke the guard. He chased her down and beat her to death. 1224, Assisi, Italy. Claire, Foundress of the poor Clare religious order, received word that the army of Frederick II, Holy Roman Emperor, was bearing down on her convent, leaving in its wake a trail of horrific pillaging. Clare went out to face the invading army with nothing more than the Eucharist in her hands. She raised the host high into the air, 
praying God to save her convent. The invading army was gripped with fear and fled without harming a single soul. These are just a few of the countless stories throughout the history of the church. People showing great devotion, sacrifice, and love for the simple bit of bread. What is it about this humble food that leads people to do such heroic, amazing things? Maybe it isn't just about bread. So what do Catholics believe? The Eucharist is one of the seven sacraments of the church. These sacraments are special means instituted by Christ by which God reaches down to us and shares his divine life. However, the Eucharist isn't just one sacrament among many. It's the sacrament of sacraments, that one toward which all the others are oriented. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the Eucharist is the source and summit of Christian life. At the center of the Eucharistic celebration are bread and wine, that by the invocation of the Holy Spirit and by the very words of Christ, repeated by an ordained priest, become Christ's own body, blood, soul, and divinity. Christ fully present. The church has a word for this, transubstantiation. Trans meaning to change and substance refers to the very essence of a thing, what it is in itself. Even though the outward appearances remain bread and wine, the reality, the substance, has changed into our Lord Jesus Christ. This sacrament has been given many names, the Lord's Supper, the breaking of bread, the Holy Sacrifice, Holy Communion. It's most commonly called the Mass, and often today by a Greek word, Eucharist, meaning Thanksgiving. The Assembly of God's people gathers to give thanks, to partake in this Holy Communion, communion with each other and with the God who loves us. In brief, the Eucharist is the sum and summary of the Catholic faith. The Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of God. In other words, the Eucharist is truly God present with us. I know it sounds impossible, and only God can make it possible. But that's what he's done. And if you think about it, and you reflect on the scriptures, and on the history of the church, you'll see that both scripture and tradition point and come to this great truth. This truth that is so beautiful about a God who is so good that he hands himself over and becomes present and available to you and to me. How big is God? The God who created life on earth, how big can we say our Lord is? Can he be contained in the earth's largest ocean? Can he tower over our highest mountain? Or is he even larger than this? The God who created the sun, the moon, every star in the sky, is there a limit to the scope of his power? But what about the details? Does God's attention extend to the smallest cell, the tiniest photon racing at the speed of light, the immeasurable closeness of atomic bonds? Does God know the number of the neurons in the human brain or the stars in the cosmos? God's power and love are in all of these things, great and small. So could God come to us as he truly is in all of his power, glory, and majesty? He could, but 
instead through his love for us, he chooses throughout history to come to us in ways we can understand. In a cloud, in a still small voice, as a child placed in a manger in a tiny village. He comes to us under these unassuming, human, tangible signs, bread and wine. The most incredible, amazing thing on the planet looks like bread and wine. And sometimes we can look at this sacrament and think it looks like bread, wine. Why would God choose to communicate his very life to us through these things? You know, if God came to us in all his power, it'd be like sitting right in front of a nuclear explosion. There's no way he'd survive it. So instead he comes to us in all his love and humility. All throughout the history of salvation, throughout the whole Old Testament, you see bread show up in these amazing miraculous ways bread rains down from heaven the manna during the time of the exodus you see bread this symbol of life show up in the tabernacle in the temple throughout the old testament the bread through much of history and across the globe has been considered a staple food i mean bread's kind of humble it's not a luxury it's not lobster right one of those basic things that people need to survive it actually makes sense when you start putting all of these pieces together that God would actually come in the form of bread. So how is the Eucharist really Jesus's body and blood? Because when we look at it, it, it still looks like bread. It still tastes like bread. It smells like bread. It still feels like bread. It has all of the outward sensible appearances of bread. In fact, it has all of the chemical properties of bread still. The change of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ is not a chemical change. If you were to take the consecrated host and bring it to a laboratory and put it under a microscope, you're going to see all of the chemical properties of bread. But here's the key. Underneath those outward appearances of bread and wine, underneath those chemical properties of bread and wine, Jesus is really present. His very body and blood, the bread and wine, are really changed into his body, blood, soul, and divinity. All the sacraments are profound mysteries, and yet their outward signs, their appearances, are usually very humble. They are signs, visible realities, that point to the invisible, to a divine grace. The water used in baptism, poured over a person's head, indicates a spiritual reality, a soul being cleansed. In confirmation, we are anointed with oil to make us witnesses. Natural things pointing to supernatural realities. This is what God does. He reaches out to us in ways we can understand. In the Eucharist, we eat humble bread, something we all do, something we all understand. These simple outward signs, bread and wine, signs of physical sustenance, point to a spiritual nourishment we can't do without. Not only does God give us our daily bread, he gives us himself as our nourishment. But there's even more. We're really missing out on the meaning of a meal. Yes, God nourishes us. But meals are a lot more than that. But we in the modern world, we often don't get it because we don't understand what meals meant in the biblical times. Typically, we tend to think of eating the same way we think of a lot of things in our culture. We think of it very pragmatically. We think of it very efficiently. I think in our minds, we think the only reason we really eat is because we have to fuel our bodies so we can just get those next calories. And we're always kind of keeping track of that stuff which is not what it means to really have a meal. Particularly in our own country, we don't get this. The lunch breaks are fast food every day. We eat at our desk, or worse, we eat in our cars. Food is disconnected from other people. 60% of us eat fast food at least once a week. We got things like TV dinners, drive-throughs, we Instagram our food. 
all these things would make the people of the ancient world absolutely cringe. Now, the people in Jesus' time understood meals fundamentally different than this. Meals were not first and foremost about efficiency and just getting your calorie counts. First and foremost, meals were about being with people. Meals were so much more than just about the food. They were about sharing life with other people. They were about an intimate communion, a, a bond, a profound relationship being established at that table. I mean, just, just looking at the Gospels, look at the number of examples we have of Jesus sharing meals with his disciples. To share a meal together meant to share in friendship. Meals meant something. And we see stories, we see examples, we actually see evidence of this all throughout the story of salvation. In the book of Song of Songs, a book that's primarily about the intimacy between God and his people, guess what it contains? A meal. Psalm 23, this describes the Lord actually setting a table for us. Even heaven is often described as a meal. I think of Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, where we see heaven described as sitting at table with the Jewish patriarchs of the Old Testament, people like Abraham and Moses and Joshua, and sharing a meal together. When you see a meal in scripture, don't think of the modern picture of it. Meals have a deeper, a richer meaning. They signify communion. The idea is that as we're gathered at that table, the same food that's going into you is going into me. And that symbolizes a profound bond between us, a sharing of life, a sharing of communion together. The effect of this communion meal means we're brothers. We have a profound friendship. And that's what God wants to do with us at every Eucharist. In the Eucharistic meal, he doesn't just want to nourish us. He wants to have an intimate, profound union with us. He wants to deepen his union with us at every Eucharist. Now, why would God want to have this kind of communion with us? Well, first, as St. John teaches us in the New Testament, God is love. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have been sharing this love for all eternity with one another. They are a communion of divine persons. Second, God created us out of love. He brought us from non-existence into existence. He didn't need to do that, but he did it out of love for us. And not just to live on the outskirts of the universe, far away from him, far away from anything important, but rather thirdly, God created us in order to share his love with us, right? That we might share his life and his love, that we might be invited into that communion of the three divine persons for all eternity. That's who our God is, the God who is love. And it's because of who he is, love, that he seeks us out in this most intimate union of love in the Eucharist. Who is God? That is the ultimate question. And to find the answer, we have to turn back to the ancient scriptures of Israel, to what the Jews considered the greatest moment of revelation in the history of humanity, where Moses came to the burning bush and encountered the fiery presence of God. God says, I am who am. In other words, Eya Asher Eya, as the Hebrew phrase has here. Now, I highlight that because in the Hebrew, that key word is going to be the essence of who God is in this incredible revelation to Moses. That great phrase, Eya, is an important and deep word it means to be. And he repeats it, Eya, Asher Eya. But here's the beautiful thing. God just isn't simply saying, look, I'm being, I'm existence in some philosophical abstract way. God gave Moses a very down-to-earth, concrete clue to what this means. In Exodus chapter 3, God calls Moses to return to Egypt and to encounter and confront the wicked Pharaoh. And Moses says in response, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And God gives Moses an amazing answer. He says, it really doesn't matter who you are, Moses. It matters that I am with you. And that's the promise, Eya Imak. By saying to Moses, I am with you, Eya Imak. And now he says, who am I? What is my name? What is my essence? Eya Asher Eya. In other words, I am the God who is existence, but not just existence in the abstract. I am the God who is presence. 
I'm not just being, I am being present. It's the good news that will give Moses courage to confront a wicked king. And it's the good news that will run throughout the story of scripture, that God is with his people. From the earliest parts of the Bible to the end, it's very clear that God wants to be with his people. We see him walking with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the day. But beyond that, every time he establishes a covenant with his people, and every time he visits them and reminds them about the covenant, we hear a consistent refrain. I will be your God, and you will be my people. Over and over and over again, the Lord expresses his desire to be one with his people, to dwell with them. You know, scripture's clear that God really wanted to be with us, to dwell with us. Think of the burning bush, the pillar of fire by night, the pillar of cloud by day, the Ark of the Covenant, the temple itself. He wanted to be with us in a unique and very real way. When we study these things, we're looking at them like foreshadowings. They're signs pointing to something. They're like echoes in reverse. Instead of getting dimmer and dimmer, the sound is getting louder and louder. God is doing something. He was preparing us for something big. The culmination and fulfillment of God's desire to be with us is fully revealed in Jesus. Uh, we, we see this most profoundly in the incarnation. The word of God becomes flesh. God wanted to be with us so badly that he, he wanted to become one of us. The fathers of the church say that the son of God became a son of man so that the sons of men might become sons of God. That should really make our jaws drop. God wanted to be with us, to breathe the same air, to suffer, to be helpless, like we're sometimes helpless, in order to save us, to share life with us. The incarnation of Jesus Christ is God present with his people. This has been the plan from the beginning. This is where the whole story reaches its climax. All of this that started with Genesis, all of the Old Testament, hundreds and thousands of years that led up to this moment where a virgin conceives and bears a son. And Matthew says, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. But at the end of the story, we're told of Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension. But does Jesus' ascension to the right hand of the Father rob us of God's presence? Is this great culmination, this great climax of God finally being with his people in this intimate and profound way in Jesus. Is that lost with the ascension? Of course not. This is the beauty and the mystery of the Eucharist. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, gave the chalice to his disciples saying, take this all of you and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Jesus spoke those words to the apostles at the Last Supper. He told them to do what he had just done. He had just caused bread and wine to 
become his body and blood. He commanded them to do this, to do what he had just done. And through the apostles, so the bishops and the priests, down through the centuries, 2,000 years. When you go to Mass, wherever it is, whenever you're going, you have just received God, Jesus Christ. You're not just reading about him in a book. He is now one with you. It's like you're the tabernacle. And then as Mass ends, he says, go in peace. There's a whole world out there that needs to see you and to hear you. Because in seeing you and in hearing you and watching how you live and love, they see Christ himself. When we're discovering what the Eucharist is, the question we should be asking isn't what is the Eucharist, it's who is the Eucharist? The Eucharist is not a thing, it is a person, it is Jesus. And that's why we heard the story about those two priests who would run inside a burning building, not to rescue bits of bread and wine, no one would do that, but to save something that's real and precious, someone that's real and precious. That's why those great stories of the men and women throughout history who devoted themselves to lifting up, to preserving the sacred host, that's why our churches have times and places set aside for adoration. That's why in every Catholic church across the world, there are tabernacles with candles burning, showing us that someone is waiting for us. Think about this. The God, the God and the Lord of the universe, the creator, as powerful as he is, as infinite as he is, as eternal as he is, as holy as he is, still humbles himself, making himself truly present for our sake. He comes to us in the forms of something so simple, so beautiful, bread and wine, something we can eat and can give us strength for our journey, but also something we can, we can store, we can keep with us. So we, we have the Lord that is giving us not only what we need today, but his presence, his, his accompaniment to be with us at every moment of our lives in our blessed sacrament, in the tabernacle. So many people today are searching for greater meaning, a greater purpose to their lives. They're, they're, they're searching for happiness. They're, they're, they're longing for something more. They're ultimately searching for God. But the good news is, our God is searching for us. He's already seeking us out. And, and he comes to us longing for an intimate relationship with us. He wants to walk beside us in life and help us in life. And he loves us so much, he comes to us in the Eucharist. So if you're someone that's longing for God's help in your life, you, you, you want to draw near to him, you want to know him better, you, you, maybe you need some guidance for a big decision you're making, or maybe there's a big problem in your marriage or family life and, and you need his help, or you just need to be encouraged, or you're carrying great burdens and wounds in your life, and, and, and you need his, his help and his support. He's there for you. He wants to draw near to you and to help you. All you have to do is turn to him. God wants to be with us. He wants to be with us because he's all good. We're not. <laughs> He wants us to be good like him, to perfect us. It's communion with a direction. We want to commune with Jesus in the Eucharist so we could be more like him. I consume the Eucharist because I want the Eucharist to consume me. It's not meant to meet you where you are and keep you there. Jesus in the Eucharist calls you higher. The Eucharist opens up an entirely new world. This is why every Mass is centered around the great mysterious truth because this is the most precious thing we have this side of eternity. This is why it's called the source and summit of our faith. There's so much to partake in something so small.
Okay. That was beautiful, Doug. That was I, just beautiful. And I'm sorry you missed um, like most of it and joined us about 20 minutes late, I think. I'm sorry, um, I thought it was 1030. <laughs> well, I, as usual, I'll send out a recording as soon as I get it back from Zoom. Okay. Um, so My reading can... group meets at four at ten thirty, and I guess that's what I was thinking. <laughs> okay. Um, um, so, what what struck you? What struck you? What um, jumped out at you, or anything that um, that was new that you you haven't seen before? or you hadn't heard before. Actually, I heard one thing that, uh, that I hadn't heard before that I'll share in a few minutes, but um, first hear from you guys. What, what are you feeling? What's going on in your head and your heart right now? Well, it makes me want to go to adoration more. <laughs> I, I had that thought right at the end when, when they were showing all of the, uh, the scenes of adoration. I had the okay. same thought, yeah, Jennifer. I think the opening scene where the priests are running into the burning building was profound. And I think it might not be a bad picture for youngsters to see when they're preparing for their first Holy Communion to see just how important we believe this is, how big it is. This is something you rush and save. I don't know how to put into words the scene that they showed us. But um, I always thought it was a challenge to explain to seven-year-olds the grandness of the Eucharist. Um, and maybe they're not meant to understand how grand it is at that age. It's something that we grow with and learn as we get older. Yeah, I agree. I, I think all, all of those images, that, that image from the Bronx the uh, Saint Tarsicius, uh, the the little girl in China. Um, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be great if um, if when we have a, a, a gospel reading about the Eucharist and somebody has to preach to just play play that seven or eight minutes mm -hmm. and let people see that because you know you guys you guys know um, that even people that are coming to mass. 60 plus percent of them don't don't really believe fully in the, that it's Christ. They believe it's some representation. They believe something that's kind of on the right road, but not they don't believe the right thing. Mm -hmm. They believe in a, the kind of representation or a symbol or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, play on Joyce's point that um, maybe they notice it sooner than you think. Um, when our youngest daughter was like nursery age and they didn't have the nursery at our church then in Texas. So you had to take your toddler in with you and oh, she was wiggly. And I had a little bag with a, with a coloring book and I don't know what else. And she's just climbing all over me and wiggling and everything. And then when we were on our way out of mass, she goes, how, she noticed something is it blew our socks off. She goes, how come God gets the big cookie? Uh, <laughs> But somehow out of that wiggly moment, she saw the priest, that moment, she saw that. She thought he was God, but I, you know, how did she get that? And that, that registered out of all that wiggling. I mean, it was, even, even a toddler might be more aware than we think. Uh -huh. That was cool. <laughs> yeah. You know, I remember Father Phil in one of his homilies um, asked us if we remember the special dates of our, of our church life, First Communion, Confirmation, and then, you know, whatever happened in terms of ordination or whatever. And I distinctly remember second grade, May 16th, my godmother, which was a tradition in the Irish culture, dressed me from head to toe, everything, from veil to shoes and so on. I remember that so clearly. Do any of you remember your first communion? Oh, yes. Father Parzik said, this is the most important day of your life. And I remember I was seven and I thought, this is it? Work. <laughs> <laughs> this is the biggest thing. 
you know, when you're seven. Anyway, yes, I remember May 6, 1962. I still remember it. I still well, have my veil. Do you? Cool. It's easier for me. I was 27 years old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so it just happened, huh, Doug? December, yeah, right. <laughs> December 6th, 1977. Wow. Yeah, I was, I, I'm a convert as well. And I remember thinking, why would I ever want real bread? It was the strangest thought is, why isn't this enough? And, and shocking, way well, I got hungry lunchtime, so my body failed me. But I, I remember thinking, this is all I ever need. When we were kids, we used to play mass. Now, I have all brothers, and I never was allowed to be the celebrant. But we use Necco wafers. Necco wafers. <laughs> my, some of my brothers were all to service and so on. And, and we just played it as one of the natural things with jacks and whatever else you played in those days. Yeah. So it was a really important. The Eucharist was very important in, in our lives growing up. Yeah, we used, I used to have an apple core and it was just round with razor on the end. And I'd take white bread and smush it and make the host because I had four sisters. So all five of us girls would, you know, play mass and communion and stuff. So you got to be celebrants. <laughs> I never did. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you notice we play mass and we played Holy Communion, but I don't ever remember playing confession when we were kids. <laughs> <laughs> not with your siblings <laughs> so Anne, Anne was lucky one of the people that she used to play mass with became a priest became a bishop right yeah yeah but he still didn't let me be the celebrant <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Any anything else? And I, I I do have a couple of other questions. Well, I'll share one thing that that I there there are two line the one line that really jumped out at me. Uh, that's not directly related to the Eucharist, but um, uh, Tim Gray said it that when he was recounting the encounter with um, uh, with God in the burning burning bush with Moses, and he, he paraphrased it, but does say this in the Bible pretty much. He says. It doesn't matter who you are, Moses. I am with you. That whoa, that is. I, I I've been in in my morning prayer for probably a week now. I've been focusing on um, uh, on the fact of um, of detachment a, a little bit more, and complete reliance on God. And boy, that that line. It doesn't matter who you are, Doug. I am. I am. God is with with you, um, and and that's all you really need in the end. Mm -hmm. um, amazing, amazing. Uh, so that that was the, the huge thing that jumped jumped out at, at me. the The other thing, uh, I, I'm, I'm I just have this crazy idea right now that that maybe one of the reasons that we have um, lo lost touch, lost reverence, lost um, lost the Eucharist somewhat in the church is this idea is that we've lost the idea of meals, lost the idea of meals together. You know, I, I, I remember when I was a kid, even even when when I had kids, when I was a kid, Sunday dinner, <laughs> was like half of the relatives that we had in Cleveland, Ohio together. Mm -hmm. So my grand, one of set of grandparents were always there. In fact, we was usually at their house. So, uh, cousins were there, aunts and uncles were there. It, it was a big deal. Um, and I know when, when my kids were growing up, the rule in our house was um, everybody, everybody came for dinner. Uh, all, all of the kids had to be there for dinner. They were allowed to invite friends. Uh, but everybody was there for dinner. Um, that that was it. You you couldn't go out and do something else. You could go out after dinner, but but dinner was um, was was important. I, and I know that's not true for most of our most of the United States, at least. Right. I, I think it's 
it's true a little bit more in Europe, actually, still. Mm-hmm. Um, but but meals are, are a big thing. But his uh, um, 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 Stefanik's thing about you know most of us eat fast food or you know or something really quick mm-hmm. while we're watching TV or or something like that instead of actually sitting down. And I wonder if 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 one of the um, the tactics that we should be taking is encouraging people to have meals together. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know, my, my image is, is it's, it's, it's the Eucharist is God sitting down with us, you know, and, and being there with us at the same time. How, how do you guys react to that? I agree with that. And I remember, well, having big families and, and doing going to Aunt Mabel's or grandma's and everything. But sometimes the parish priest was invited, and that was always cool. So yeah, we miss them. I mean, I, I, we still have Thanksgiving and Christmas together, but um, I try to sit down and stuff, and and still do that. But you know, I I agree with you. I notice, um, yeah, a lot of families don't do any of that. So. I just, you know, I'm thankful for the good childhood and all that stuff. You know, it's different now. So I'm just glad I was a part of that anyway and trying to keep doing it with the kids and grandkids. So, you know, is, is it just me or when you think of, um, of times, maybe like over the last five years where you've had great interaction with others? I actually can only think of two times and the most important time is meals. And, and the other single one is hiking with my daughter. Uh-huh. And that, I mean, that's just one person. Um, but all of the other times are at meals. To, so is it similar with you guys? When I was working yeah. full time and Tom was always working um, and the kids were little as um, soon as they're big enough to put in a bar stool, I would be serving off the stove, putting in front of them, get them more juice, get them more this, watch how much they ate. Yes, you may be excused. And I never sat down. I ate what was left over in the pan. And <laughs> my, when we moved and I quit working and, and kids and I sat for a simple lunch one day and it was two hours, two hours. And I went, oh my gosh, I enjoy my children so much. We had so much to say to each other. And then um, I told my, I must have mentioned it because my oldest daughter said, yeah, mom. And then you're always muttering to yourself. I must have, I was talking to myself. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do this. And I wanted them fed, bathed and happy when dad got home because I didn't want him to walk into chaos because he got to be with them such a short time. I didn't want it ruined by them fighting or me being hungry or whatever. But I did not even, I didn't even notice I was doing it. And um, a, a good thing that happened to us was having that day because for then on, we were more careful with meals. And if nothing else, we don't have a lot of places we lived, we didn't have family near us, but we would go out for brunch um, after mass because you kind of keep that church, you're in your good clothes, you're on your best behavior, keep that church feeling going a little longer. And so we, we made that our tradition. I remember the big Catholic weddings. And as a kid, you know, oh, my mom was the youngest of 11. We had a lot of relatives and there's lots of weddings and all that. But it was fun to be together with everybody, you know, for that. It was fun. So Maybe. we did do quite a bit. Um, that's for sure. Maybe we can make an effort to, to start dining with our family and friends more often we can just make a conscious decision to do it i remember once in when i lived in jackson someone called and said can you come over for dinner uh these people are coming and just bring a salad or just you and i thought how how impromptu how beautiful it is and we all showed up with something different and had a meal and it didn't have to be fancy or it didn't have to go with that and and i'll always remember that we just had a happy time together eating whatever we had and we can still do that. We can make an effort and say, okay, come on over. I would invite y'all over to my house right now, but I'm a little far away. But I think <laughs> we should just 
Well, we did that, Joyce, when when you guys were here, because we would have carry-in dinners, and even now, yeah. Tom and I say we'll we'll put the meat together. Everybody yeah. just bring side dishes. We don't even tell them what to bring. Yeah. And now, because of COVID, it's a lot slower. So we've been looking for like a couple at a time. Yeah. So we're gonna have. Um, is it Vicky and Adam? Uh, are going to come because they were interested in music and so no we might bend their arms a little bit I don't know <laughs> <laughs> but it but it but you know it's just smaller but we still try to focus on some is there somebody is there somebody we'd like to meet we've seen him in church all this time we don't even know their first name uh -huh. try to make that happen yeah yeah we can do that if we put our minds to it <coughs> <coughs> Well, meals are always a big thing in our family, and we've always had, we always had the kids always had to be there for dinner, like you were mentioning, Doug, and so I noticed our children are all in Texas, and we go for November and December to visit with them, and I noticed that they all, almost, all except maybe one family, we have five children, and uh, they have everyone whenever we go to dinner at their house. I mean, that's how we get together with them usually. And all of the grandkids are always there. Everybody is always at the meal. So I'm so happy that they've carried on that tradition because I do think it's important. And I agree with you when you said uh, about COVID. Uh, that's been one of the problems I've had with it because that's kind of the way we socialize with people is through meals. And COVID kind of killed most of that for us as far as with our friends. So I'm really, happy that we're starting to get back into doing that yeah that's great i you just remind me of something pat uh my, i think my kids have tried to carry it on uh some better than others but every tuesday night my daughter that lives in denver invites everybody in her family um and their friends and her brother her brother over for dinner and they call it um T tuesday family food Oh, That's nice! Great. And um, and she cooks usually something really simple, but but she cooks and they get together and they they um, they typically FaceTime with us while they're there. Oh, <laughs> it's pretty rowdy. Yeah. Um, and we've we've been blessed to be able to be there a couple of times on Tuesdays when they're when they're doing that. And I, I'm thinking, <clears throat> um, Marsha, Marsha, and Ed. <clears throat> um, um, <clears throat> Well, I think we're going to see them later this year in person, but what are we going to see them at a dinner for Thanksgiving? <laughs> you know, that, I mean, that's the whole reason to come together. And if, you know, the whole visit and the whole interaction is focused around a meal. Um, so I don't know. That's cool. That's yep. cool. Very nice. Making me hungry. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, we got about three or four minutes left. Any, um, any, any other insights or any other things besides just thinking about eating? <laughs> like, along with eating, uh, for some reason, my grandchildren call me Mana. Ah. It's supposed to be it's, uh, the other grandparents are Grandma and Grandpa. If for us, it's Papa and Mana. And when the, my daughter said, "Is that okay with you?" I was so blown away because they're not just the reference, but the responsibility. Maybe I'm supposed to bring them all together in this. Maybe I'm supposed to fight to get them back in church. I pray for it. I don't fight with my kids over it. Maybe that's what I'm supposed to do. It's humbling and terrorizing at the same time. I want to live up that name. Mm -hmm. I pray every day that some of the kids and grandkids go back to the church, you know, that's all you can do. Put it in the book of prayers at church and mention it all the time. And I'm not the only one, boy, I'm telling you. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, of the same thing. So I have faith. I'm just hanging in there. I'm just being patient because sometimes God works in mysterious ways and it takes a while. So I'm not giving up. Yeah, here's a, um, for, for any of you who are worried about friends or relatives that have, have um, walked away from the church and you, you want them to come back. Um, I heard, I heard a, a comment the other day that, that I think is really, really good. One thing to pray for is that they encounter somebody that's not you. 
that brings them back to the church because we all put it on ourselves and we're we're trying to do all those things and and it may be that we're trying so hard that we're pushing them the other way but if 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 we pray that somebody else does something or says something that brings them uh, i think that's a really good prayer uh-huh that they I remember somebody a else telling us that um don't bug them you know to that effect you know just don't bug them and just, you know, show a good example and all that. But you're right. I think, you know, somebody else where they'll see it, you know. <clears throat> all right. Anything else from anybody? Thank you. It was wonderful. Yeah. Tell your friends. I will, when we uh, get the, uh, when I get the video, I will, uh, uh, I'll send it out to you. Um, there's a, a closing prayer that I'd like to, to read to you. <laughs> this is cool from, uh, from Fulton Sheen. The greatest love story of all time is contained in a tiny white host. Yep, that's neat. I wonder why he's not a saint. You know, I said, you know, because as a kid, my parents loved it and I loved listening to him and everything. But um, well, we could let's talk about that next time, Jennifer. Okay. If you want to ask, I, I can give you a little explanation. That, oh, okay, that the uh, the, the fact is, last year he was scheduled to be um, uh, to be, I mean, he is beatified, so he's blessed Fulton J. Sheen, oh, uh, okay. Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, and he was supposed to be canonized last October, but uh, there were some uh, allegations of child sexual abuse in uh, one of the dioceses where he was a bishop. And so they kind of put it on hold because they didn't want to create any scandal. Uh -huh. I, I think he will become a saint. Yeah, I did. Uh, um, I mean, I remember a priest or something in New York said he had something on him, but he wouldn't tell us. Yeah. And that's why. It wasn't about him. It was oh. about him specifically, uh, but, but things surrounding him. So let's talk about that next time. Okay, okay. <laughs> and let's pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy, I will draw water from the wells of salvation. Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the nations. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great is our midst and the Holy One of Israel. Amen. In the name of the Amen. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thanks for joining you guys. Um, Thank you. I, Harry tried to get on while we were going. I got a text from him. He just was not able to get on with his computer. So my guess is that he'll join us next week, Deacon Harry. Um, uh, but have a great week. Some of you, you see in church. Others, I'll see you next week. Yep. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.